uh, Igor, and do you, um, yeah, do you, uh, do you see the screen? All right. Uh, I, I see you. Uh, I, I've seen your idea. Oh, yeah. Oh, you see idea. You see idea. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Classes and trades back. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, 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 yes. I'm still trying to, um, to do all the things I have to do. We have at least two joined. Marxism. No, we have a lot of people joined actually. Okay. We have a lot of people already. All right, we'll start in about uh, one minute. Okay, good. Where is the chat? I'm kind of wondering. Usually there was chat. Is there chat missing now? I can see there is Marcis, Marcis and I suck. Okay. Greetings. Uh, but where is that? <laughs> uh, it, <laughs> It's in the middle of, uh, of the panel with your sh sharing screen. There is chat button, raise hand and QA. Oh, okay. okay, that's actually great. Actually, actually, uh, yeah, we'll be starting any moment now. Okay, so shall we start? Good evening, everyone. Very happy to um, see you all uh, for this um, meetup. We will be uh, continuing where we um, left it off last time. And um, let's start with a couple of intros. So first of all, uh, do all of you hear me all right still? If you don't, then write in the Zoom webinar chat. And if you do, then also write in the Zoom webinar chat if you hear me okay. Okay, so Martis, hi Martis, hi Isaac. Okay, a lot of pluses. So it seems like everyone is hearing me okay. Okay, very good. Then my next question is, uh, I hope I mean, nothing has changed in the bootcamp project. If you were attending the previous time, then everything should be working. We're just switching to a different um, different module. The module is classes and traits, and the test tests for it are in classes and traits specs. I'm actually hoping we will cover this, and then also cover some other things. Um, but, uh, but let's, let's start and let's see where we get today. Um, 
If you did not attend, is there anyone here who did not attend the first lecture, but who has joined now? Okay, so, okay, first time. So, well, the situation is as follows, basically, that we will, getting, I, okay, Yuris, and do you have uh, the project checked out? Are the tests working? In the meat of description, there's kind of some preconditions that you would need the Scala Bootcamp project uh, from our Evolution Gaming GitHub checked out and the tests working. I will probably not be spending a whole lot of time uh, kind of trying to explain how to do that because, oh, tests are all failing. Okay, idea is open, tests are all failing. That's exactly what we need. So our goal uh, for um, this um, meetup initially is gonna be to get the classes and traits spec tests working. Circle should be correct. Minimum bounding rectangle should be correct. That would be a good start if we get there. Um, so let's start. So I will not be going into a lot of uh, OOP details. First of all, we in the Scala world, we don't focus so much on the OOP aspects. Uh, um, inheritance method overloading and all that. Um, but uh, they're still needed for compatibility with Java. Uh, so classes in Scala, they're basically blueprints for creating objects or so-called instances, and they can contain uh, methods. So this here is a class called mutable point, uh, and it has uh, some variables in it, variables X and variable Y. It has some methods, method move, uh, and it could be implementing a trait. Here traits are kind of like interfaces uh, in, in Java. So yeah, it, it, it could be implementing a trait here, but it isn't. Um, and um, collectively variables, values, uh, and um, methods are called uh, class members. So here we are defining a class. And uh, here we are instantiating a class. So we're basically saying this uh, value with a name point one is gonna be an instance of the class mutable point. Uh, and we're invoking the uh, constructor here with values X is three and Y is four. Uh, and we can access these uh, variables. Now we can access point one X, kind of became public. Uh, or we can print the whole uh, point. And uh, now my question to you is, and I hope you can answer in the chat, uh, is this good design? You know, should we be modeling our points this way? Why or why not? Scala says mutable is bad. Yes, I mean, that's a good answer, but why is it bad? I mean, in general, we, think that idiomatic Scala avoids uh, mutable variables, but why? Okay, Sergey, it can be better. It's okay to disagree. Okay, Martis is explaining why. So Martis is saying, you don't know what, who will change state. That's a good answer. I will make a little bit longer pause in case anyone else wants to explain why uh, it may not be the best design, and also what are, what other alternatives can we think of? Well, Vitaly, I mean, if we would say val here, then it, it would be uh, read-only as in TypeScript, but then we can't do this, we can't do move. Yeah, so I, th I think Martis' answer is quite valid in, in that any time we have such mutable points, we really start, like we can still work with them, but the load, the cognitive load on us as developers uh, becomes higher because we have to think about who actually mutated this point and maybe something else was still referring 
to the existing uh, to the old point and then suddenly we change the point that it refers to uh, and also maybe multiple threads were trying to mutate the point at the same time so suddenly they were, had some race conditions and one of them won one of them lost and basically the amount of things that can go wrong the bugs that we can uh, make in our code uh, becomes uh, higher the more mutable data we're operating with uh, so I think we will return to this. We will return here to the um, class point and implement it otherwise. Um, but uh, first we'll discuss traits. So traits define common interfaces that classes can form to. They're kind of similar to Java's interfaces. Uh, traits uh, don't have parameters like constructor parameters, but classes and objects, they can extend traits and thus they implement those traits. And uh, this allows us to um, program to interface instead of implementation. Traits, if we program against traits, uh, then we program towards interfaces and that makes our code more testable in a sense that then we, for our tests, uh, we can, uh, create test implementations of our in interfaces and our tests become simpler. And that's of course very important because we want all our code to be uh, well testable. So here we have um, a um, hierarchy uh, of a um, couple of traits. We have a trait called shape, which has both bounds. And here we have a trait called bounded. Uh, which um, says that an object can be bounded within some bounding rectangle with a minimum x coordinate, maximum x coordinate, minimum y coordinate, maximum y coordinate. And also there's a location where a shape is at, which is an x and a y. It's, it's a tiny bit um, maybe artificial, maybe you wouldn't necessarily use this particular design in your code, uh, but maybe sometimes you would. And I want to point out a couple of important uh, things here. The most important, actually, one of the most important things in this code is the sealed. Uh, it is um, sealed uh, keyword, which you can put in front of um, traits. And I want, does anyone know here in the chat, what does sealed actually stand for? Why, why, why is it important? Uh, yeah, it's not really final because we also have final. Final means it can't be overridden further. Uh, sealed means that all the uh, all the all the classes or other traits which extend this trait are located in this file, which means well, final would mean it's not extendable. Sealed means it can be extended. You can see here that the sealed trait uh, located is extended by shape. And then the sealed trait shape is extended by point. But we, what we can't do, we can't go into basics and say, uh, you know what? We will have a case object something extends located. Uh, and here, this located is saying illegal inheritance from sealed trait located because we were trying to make this case object uh, extend located outside of the file where located is defined. And um, this actually has the benefit that, first of all, if you seal this sealed trait shape, you know you don't have to look across your whole code base for things that extended. You can just look in this file, and that's more readable. But it has another important property. Whenever, and we'll get to that. Uh, when we get to um, case match here, do we have match? Right, so whenever do these sort of pattern matching, match case clauses, if we are matching on something that is sealed, the compiler is gonna help us 
and tell us whenever we miss any of the uh, pattern match clauses. And that's extremely important. And that's basically one of the most useful features of Scala. Uh, the, the idea is that whenever, if we were be, would be like, the, the, this was real software, we were building some, I don't know, geometry package. Whenever we would add something, we would, we would have these case match statements, which work with circles, which work with points. And then suddenly we would be starting like, okay, final case class square extends shape and do something with it. We define this and uh, the compiler would tell us all the places where we have forgotten to handle squares in compile time. It wouldn't happen in runtime as it would in many, many other uh, programming languages, uh, but instead it would happen in uh, compile time and therefore um, it would really save us time and it really adds up. Uh, so any questions in chat on the sealed keyword and how it's used? And uh, also, uh, I, I forgot to introduce at the beginning, we, we got uh, Igor Kapustian, uh, who is uh, one of our um, Scala lead engineers and blackjack team, who is uh, also participating uh, tonight. So Igor, do you want to add something? Did I forget something important on these topics? Do you want to point something out in this case? Uh, hi all. Uh, basically, a sealed trait is something that uh, has a finite, uh, like finite uh, ch children scope. So you are defining sealed trait, and you will have some uh, some like classes, uh, like case classes extending it, and so it's good for pattern matching and other useful things Scala brings. Okay. I also want to note uh, that in general, these sort of constructs are uh, called algebraic data types, ADTs. They're present also in other, uh, other uh, programming languages, but like basically you can also model your data using algebra algebraic data types uh, and um, you can kind of learn more about this if you Google by this, uh, by this term. Um, okay, let's move on. We're actually moving on to the first exercise. And that exercise is to um, implement final case class circle uh, in a way which makes the circle tests um, pass. So basically here we have a lot of um, three question marks, which um, stand for not implemented yet. Um, and your task is to implement it. These methods for circle. Let me ask. Does everyone understand the task? If you don't, then please write in chat and I will try to explain it in some more reasonable way. Okay, so we here have a case class circle and I'll actually, I'll get what is a case class in the next section, doesn't matter at this point. Uh, it's a circle and we have to, um, yeah, I, I agree, min x is center x mi minus radius. And it has to extend shape. And because it has to extend shape, it has to implement a bunch of methods. You know, we won't be implementing these methods and IntelliJ is gonna complain that we have to either make it abstract or we have to implement them. So here, we're gonna be implementing them. So your job is to implement the methods for located which is X and a Y. And you can use useful center X, center Y values from circle and implement these methods, min X, max X, min Y, max Y from bounded. Um, and 
I agree with Kirill that min x, for example, is center x minus radius. Maybe it's good to explain what is x and y in this uh, case, because it's it's the most difficult part. Of um, for located x, I, I would say that for circle, we want x to be the center x. And for y, we want x to be the center y. Okay, uh, so so it's, it, it's center, OK. Okay, I see a lot of correct implementations. So let's run our tests and hope that they pass. They pass. This is excellent. OK. Um, are there any questions? OK, which implementation is more preferable? First or second? Let's see. Um, oh, uh, for point. Well, I would use the second implementation, not the mutable point. I mean, unless there was some really fantastic reason why it needed to be a mutable point. Uh, in Scala, I would always use the immutable point as an implementation. Okay. Um, case classes. Case classes are like regular classes, but they add some features. And those are useful features because they're commonly um, handy and they're good for modeling immutable data. So they, they have all the functionality of regular data, but uh, the constructors, and here we can see like an example of a case class, final case class, uh, their constructors um, are public value fields, publicly accessible. So basically center X and center Y and radius, they become publicly accessible, but read only because they're val. Uh, they have an apply method. So here, for example, point, we don't have to do new, we don't have to do new point here for if it's a case class, point is a case class, we can just do point. So we save some symbols. Uh, they Uh, minimum bounding rectangle we haven't implemented yet, Yuris. Uh, this we will have to fix here. It's not implemented yet. Only the circle should be correct code should be passing at this point. Yeah, you can see it in the screen. That Yeah, I'm also actually running the whole thing and only yeah. the first one is passing. So uh, apply method, which is... Uh, helpful for constructing. Unapply method, which allows it to be used in a match expression. So this is a pattern matching. We're actually gonna get into this in more detail in the next section. But here you can see we are matching the shape. And as we know, shape can be a point or it can also be a circle. And here we're matching and we're doing an uh, kind of a destructuring of the point. We're checking that this is a point, And in case this is a point, we're assigning x to x and y to y. And we can refer to these x's like this. We can also do some other things. Like instead, we could be doing um, case. Uh, uh, and then we could be doing something like uh, 
this. So we are saying, okay, so this is a point and we don't care what the uh, values are, uh, but instead we're gonna be calling it P and then we are accessing, accessing it like that. It's basically the same thing. Or, whoops, I have my key, actually have my, um, something wrong with my key layout. Uh, or we can do this. We can say, and in that case, we don't even need to know how many fields it has. We say for any P with a uh, type of point, we will say that P is the point and, and we are pattern matching with it. But, but really, uh, the unapply method allows us to do this. Uh, there is a copy method. So here, like if we want to modify the X coordinate for our point, the point is immutable, right? We can't do point two, point, point four is point, oh, sorry, we can't say point two X is 17. Doesn't allow us because it's immutable. So if instead we want to, uh, or three, if instead we want to have a new point, which is like point two, but with X coordinate of three, then we are doing a copy and we're passing X equals three here to do the copy. Uh, equals and hash code are generated so we can compare them and use them in, in maps, for example. And also a two string is generated, which uh, prints it in a nice way. So case classes come with a lot of batteries included and that's really useful. So uh, we, we like to model a lot of our data as case classes. Are there any questions on the case classes so far? Igor, do you wanna add anything on case classes? No, I think a uh, very good explanation. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so I'm, I'm gonna be make, taking a little pause here in case anyone wants to ask questions about case classes. Uh, and if not, then we have the next exercise. Uh, this is basically just a, um, This is basically uh, just a coding exercise that doesn't really, it's not really that specific towards classes and traits, but still, so we have here um, a goal uh, to implement minimum bounding rectangle. And it's actually gonna be uh, returning a new bounded implementation. Uh, and here we have a couple of uh, the, the methods for bounded already implemented, except they're wrong. That's why the tests are failing. Uh, you can think about which of the methods are implemented correctly. Like one of them is implemented correctly, the rest of them are wrong. And your goal is to fix them so that they're correct. Um, it kind of takes it kind of takes a set of objects, set of bounded objects and it returns the bounded, the bounding rectangle of, of type bounded, which includes all these objects, the minimum such rectangle, which includes all such objects. It's called the minimum bounding rectangle. And, um, and we have some solutions and we'll, we'll give some time so that kind of everyone can uh, come up with a solution. Okay, I see a lot of uh, correct solutions. Indeed. Okay. 
Let's take a look if I actually did it right or not. Yep, test passed. Okay, any questions on the exercise? Okay, so here's another example of pattern matching and exhaustiveness checking. So, um, your exercise now is to create another shape class called rectangle. Uh, so here we have a pattern match statement which matches all the shapes. So for an X, which is a shape, which we got as a parameter here, it is pattern matching all kinds of shapes. So right now, as defined, it's points and it's circles. But your goal is to add another shape and check that the compiler is going to complain for this describe method, for this pattern match, that um, we have not written code in describe to actually uh, handle rectangles. Is the task reasonably clear or should I repeat? Well, Yuris, initially, I actually mean that you define uh, a new uh, case class rectangle, which implements shape. Like, don't adjust the describe yet. You need to do something like final case class rectangle. Write something here and write something here and then write something here, something like that. Uh, Yuris, do I understand it correctly that uh, X and Y it is the middle of this rectum? Um, I don't think, <laughs> yeah, that would be reasonable actually. X and Y is going to be uh, the middle of this rectangle. Good. Let's try. All right, so we implemented um, implemented rectangle here. Actually, I, I I guess I'll wait a bit. Maybe your implementations are different. I have the same. If any of you need more time on the rectangle, then please write in chat and, and we'll take a longer pause. If not, then I'll, I'll be slightly moving on.
Okay, Yelena, fair enough. So, Mark, uh, I think your I think your rectangle. Yeah, I should have given actually more time. <laughs> Well, your, your implementation is actually quite interesting, I think. Uh, hold on, let's see. Yeah, your implementation is actually quite reasonable, in my opinion. Um, Mark, your implementation, I think, is going to be uh, going to not really, it's going to have an infinite uh, loop uh, for anyone calling X. Oh yes, a lot of you are sending messages to all panelists. Please change the messages, the addresses of messages to all panelists and attendees. So that when you send messages, then uh, everyone can see them. So we have context about what I'm actually discussing. So here we see that even, even the rectangle case class, there's multiple ways how to implement it. Uh, there's Udis S way, which uh, defines uh, the center and defines the width and the height. And then we can calculate the min X and max X using center and width. There is the way I chose. And initially I was gonna call these things X1, but the problem is if we call them X1, like x1, x2, then suddenly we have to implement the min x from bounded anyway. And then I thought, okay, well, why should we, if we can just call it min x, b may be more descriptive. Uh, and um, and um, have less code to write. We don't have to implement those methods if we already have the values named the same way. Now, of course, the problem here with this design, we can discuss what are the, uh, what are the drawbacks. Can anyone see the main drawback with this solution of rectangle as opposed to the one that Uris S has in chat? Well, actually, I'll shortly post, I'll post this here just in case the video doesn't log Uris S solution. So here's another solution, rectangle two. And in my opinion, both have pros and cons. Uh, and, and I want you to think about what are the pros and cons of this rectangle versus that rectangle. Any ideas? Yeah, for the first one, it's harder to understand what's height and what's width. I mean, we can start implementing stuff like the height equals um, y and the width. Actually, it's vice versa, I think, right? So, so we can do something like this. Um, uh, if we would need height and widths, but we don't at the moment. I think the main drawback actually of this rectangle is that we can construct a rectangle which would be kind of invalid. Uh, because we can suddenly start saying, well, a rectangle equals rectangle um, thousand ten. One, three. And 
the min x is going to be a thousand, the max x is going to be a ten, and the compiler is gonna isn't gonna really catch this bug, and we will have to catch it some other way. Uh, while in case of rectangle two, we don't really have this problem. I mean, okay, we want widths and height to be positive, so we can still construct an invalid rectangle, but it's basically, it's a different failure mode than this. So what we can do, I guess here, for example, is uh, we can say that when we um, construct it, here we have this x1 double, x2 double, y1 double, y2 double. And here we would say new rectangle, uh, math uh, min x1, x2, math max x1, x2, math min y1, y2, math max y1, y2. And here suddenly we no longer, like we are guarding this and I think then we can put this constructor as private so that no one touches it. Uh, and this will now preclude us from being able to trade invalid rectangles. Um, but in reality, like what I'm getting at here is uh, that the design of your data determines uh, quite a lot and you want to design your data in a way uh, so that invalid uh, data structure contents are impossible in compile time as much as possible, uh, or at least you want to kind of guard so that the clients of your, uh, of your data structure, so to speak, they don't have a chance to uh, uh, create invalid uh, data structure contents like we could here with this particular rectangle. Um, okay. Any more questions? Does anyone need more time on the rectangles? Do any of you have any questions on the on the rectangle business? I mean, we will we will proceed with the pattern matching now. Okay. So here, I will be quite surprised if our compiler isn't angry at us for not handling the rectangle case in this describe. Let's see if that actually happens. There should be a warning case. It does. Uh, so the compiler actually detected and you can see how nicely it presents this um, information. Basically, it's saying this rectangle you just created, it's a shape. Shape is the sealed trait. And here, if you're doing pattern matching, you should be handling all the different shapes that you have. Uh, but instead, your pattern match may not be exhausted. It would fail on the input of rectangle. So what I want you to do now is to add another, uh, add the missing code for describe to handle rectangle. Okay, so Vitaly says he doesn't have a messages panel. So I think it's here, view tool windows messages. That's where it should be. 
If you go there, do you have the messages panel? I mean, it could be that you didn't launch the rebuild. That's why it didn't really catch it. So you may want to do build build project here. Or if not, then view tool windows messages and you should have some messages. Also because, we, also because uh, his solution uh, doesn't throw a warning. So it could be hidden. Mm. He already implemented rectangle, rectangle oh, case. Yes, Vitaly, you already implemented the rectangle case. That's why uh, you don't get the warning. There's nothing to warn you about. The other thing I want to say is that normally we would uh, adjust the compiler settings to make this warning into like an actual error so that we can't really miss it. Okay, so this is how we would implement the case, uh, the rectangle case. And by the way, this describe does the exact same thing as to string. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of doesn't really add that much value. This is just to explain pattern matching and exhaustiveness checking. Um, and also the other thing that are, that is important about, um, oh, actually, no, we got more exercises here, right? So the next exercise is to change the implementation of minimum bounding rectangle to return a rectangle instance. And also think about what are the pros and cons like here, if we are returning rectangle instead, uh, is it better or is it worse than returning uh, a, a new bounded interface dynamically kind of? Is the exercise clear to everyone? If not, then please write in chat. And if I've lost you completely at some point and you want to like, I don't know, for me to go back and explain something that was quite earlier, uh, then, um, then I'm happy to do that as well. So the recording should be available. Uh, I mean, my laptop is recording. Uh, so if I don't run out of disk space, then there is gonna be a recording and it's gonna be published. We actually published the first uh, part, uh, the first lecture as well from last week. So Vitaly, the exercise is actually this one. Change the implementation of minimum bounding rectangle to return a rectangle instance and think about what are the pros and cons. Like what are the pros and cons of returning a rectangle instance as compared to returning a, just a new bounded interface? Is the exercise clear for everyone? And if, if you if any of you have any questions, then please write in chat and I will try to try to help.
Okay, Vitaly has an implementation. Does anyone else need more time for the uh, implementation of minimum bounding rectangle using the rectangle case class? All right, so Sergey, you also implemented, do you want to copy paste the solution or is it the same as Vitaly's? Right, Vitaly, and since you implement the solution, which do you think is better? The one that was before or this one? All right, so any ideas which solution is preferable? Igor, do you have any ideas? Which was better? And uh, does it actually matter? In, uh, in, in second case, we have rectangle, yes. But in other implementation, we can, uh, can require some kind of other structure as well, like a circle, for, for instance. But of course, uh, for rectangle, it is uh, like concise. This. Yeah, to me, to me, this one, we're basically gonna cache the results. Like if there's a lot of objects, like if that's, I don't know, 10,000 objects, then we're kind of calculating this one. Uh, we're going through them just four times. But in case we had the previous implementation, we would be going through them on every, uh, every time we were accessing the min x or max x of that bounded. So we, we would be doing it every time. But um, this one's going to take up a tiny bit of memory. So it's not really the same thing, um, which, is, which is sometimes important. Any questions on this so far? Or we can proceed with uh, generic classes and type parameters. OK, so as for methods, as we saw last time, in square brackets, we can have type parameters for methods. Same thing about, I think if we change def to val in the previous solution, then it would be the same thing. It would cache them. It would, uh, it would, it would gain kind of all the benefit of this one. 
Um, but we wouldn't use rectangle, we would use bounded. So let's see. So like this. That's what Igor is proposing. Yes, and we have less dependencies. And uh, uh, I actually agree with Igor. So this is maybe the best of both worlds. Um, so we have less dependencies and we're not depending on, on rectangle being actually implemented. Um, thank you, Igor. You're welcome, no problem. Um, so um, stack uh, with a type parameter A, same as methods had type parameters in the same way that for peak we we could do all this, you know, type parameter. Same way, uh, we, we can have a type parameter for stack, uh, which is, in this case, A. It's a stack of any type of A. And we're internally holding here elements, which is a list, an empty list by default. And then we can work with the stack. So we can do like, I don't know, empty stack is, uh, stack uh, well um, with a is uh, empty stack a. Uh, with a b is with a push b um Yelena, null is a Java null, which uh, can lead to null pointer exceptions. And we, like in Scala, the empty list is represented by nil, not by null. It's actually a little bit, uh, like there's a lot of these things in Scala, which, and they're all different. There's null, which is the Java null, and we don't really use it. There's null as a type, uh, there is nothing as a type. There is nil, which represents the empty list. And there's probably something else that I've forgotten, but they're all different things, luckily. Uh, and here we can do like a, a peak. With a B peak. Um, my question to you, just to make sure you understand what is the actual code which is written here. Uh, so if we do x, y equals with a b pop. Actually, this is wrong, sorry. So my question to you, just to um, just to make sure we understand this uh, piece of Scala code, is what is going to be printed by this code, and why? Sorry, scroll back now. Do you, do you understand the do you understand the task? Yes, peak is just returning the top element from the stack without modifying it. 
Okay, Igor thinks it's none. Fair enough. Kirill says B, stack B. Okay, any other ideas? Uh, Yelena, peak is not printing anything. The printing is done here, only here. Igor, by ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, ah, uh, are you saying that there's going to be some other answer? Okay, Kirill K has a theory that is just B. So I'm going to, I'm going to, actually, I just kind of improvised this task. So I don't know the answer, but let's try to guess. I'll, I'll make my, uh, my uh, version uh, known as soon as, um, soon as, the, okay. So in my opinion, what's going to happen, it's going to print, um, it's going to print B comma, oops, it's going to print B comma stack list A. That's my theory anyway. And I could be wrong actually. Yeah, Yuri says is saying B stack A. And I think it's B stack list A. And, and let's see. I mean, <laughs> let's see. Oh, man. It's my rectangle. What happened? Okay, so I want to know these earlier printouts, they of course don't count because they were printed by earlier code. And here we see uh, this is the actual printout. And we can see that I added some extra quotes, which shouldn't be there. Um, so I'd say Yuris S was the closest. Um, so what happened here? Let's take a look. Uh, let, let, let's just take a look so we understand. Um, so we start with an empty stack and it's a stack of string, which means that for this particular string, uh, A, uh, for this particular stack, A is going to be of type string. So with A is going to be a stack with inside it a list of A. Um, if we're going to push a B into a with A, we will now get a stack with a list inside. And because push is prepending the X that it's passed to the list, and we will work more with lists in the next chapter, it's like this. It's a stack list B A. So once we peek at this stack, we're going to be getting some B. It's going to be getting the first elements through P and returning as an option, head option. So it's sum of B. But we are, not, we are not using this B element. We are not using it. I'm just explaining what's in each of these, uh, each of these values. So result we're actually using. So result is going to take with A uh, and um, so it's returning. It's actually, it's actually, okay. So basically it's using peak. If the stack is empty, peak is going to return none. Uh, if it's um, full, it's going to do a map. It's going to turn this sum into a tuple uh, where the first element is whatever peak returned. And the uh, second element is a new stack which just contains the tail. So that's the, uh, it's a option. So it's a sum. Inside it is a tuple. 
inside the tuple, the first element is the B, which is the part that some uh, that peak returned. And then the second element is the remaining stack. So it's like a stack list A. So this result, and then we're doing a matching on this, a pattern match on this. And the pattern match branch that we're getting into is the sum branch because this is a sum and it's gonna be doing a destructuring here. It's taking this tuple inside here, it's destructuring it and it's assigning X is the B and Y is the stack list A. So here's the X, here's the Y. And I, uh, I, I, I agree that this may seem a bit complicated. Uh, so it's kind of okay if you don't fully follow at this point. I think we were using actually map here, which we maybe didn't even learn yet. It's actually, there's a little bit of a circular dependencies between the modules. Uh, but we'll be doing more of these exercises. It will get more and more clear. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm happy to go into some more clarification here on this particular uh, thing which we just did. Or if not, then we can try moving into the next module, which is going to be um, control structures. Um, and um, I'm also happy to go into any more uh, questions for the classes and traits module, which we just did. So just, uh, just let me know. All right, let's move to, um, let's move to the next structure. How much time do we have actually? Supposed that we still have 55 minutes. Can I also share my example in uh, this chat? So like this. Okay. So let's move on to the next, um, module, which is called control structures and control structures spec. And first let's check if we actually have tests and if those tests fail, they're supposed to fail now. Oh, and by the way, just to jump back here, if by any accident we had this as a stack of int and we were trying to start pushing strings into it, uh, it would fail. It would say, look, your stack was supposed to be a stack of int. If it's not a stack of int, then um, it, it should be, um, you can't push strings into a stack of int. And also I think in some cases it's gonna be inferring this. So you can do something like, something like this. So you can create a new stack and immediately push something into it. And based on this, it's going to be inferring that this is a stack of int, stack of int, and it's not going to let you push strings into it afterwards. You have to start with a start with a string, and then it's going to infer. You haven't really said that empty stack is a stack of string. It inferred it based on what you did with it. And uh, this is a stack of string now. Now you can push the other strings into it. Does it make sense? Okay. So control structures, good news. We have tests and they fail. Let's make them succeed. Um, so for control structures, open your control structures Scala here and execute control structures spec Scala. So one of the most basic control structures is the ifs and else and it's an expression which means it returns a value. The basic form is if boolean one, some sort of result which is going to be returning else if boolean two or else the other result and result is going to be assigned it returns a value and 
you can assign this expression to a value. You can omit the curly braces if you have something short. And also here, of course, within curly braces, you can start writing some other things like uh, while a is four plus five, and then we return the a, things like that. Uh, as usual, between curly braces in Scala. So my first task to you is to implement FizzBuzz uh, using if then else. I hope a lot of you know FizzBuzz. If not, there's a Wikipedia link. But the short summary is that uh, you get passed in an integer n, and you have to return uh, the string FizzBuzz for numbers which divide as 15, Fizz for those which divide by 3, and Buzz for those which divide by 5. Or you return the input number as string, and it's actually in Scala, like you can do, you can do four to string, for example, for the other numbers. So, is the exercise clear, or is there more explanation needed? So Dmitris, do your tests pass? Because I'm not sure you are handling all the uh, cases. I mean, if they do pass, then we have a bug to fix in the tests. If I remember correctly, I actually did the tests extremely in a way where there isn't uh, the FizzBuzz implemented, we are uh, actually, uh, you know, obviously didn't type all this up in, uh, in tests, but. Okay, so we have a lot of solutions already. Does anyone need more time for the solution? Write in the chat then.
All right. So I was actually doing some weird stuff here. Um, okay, so we got a lot of fizz buzz. Uh, Any questions on it then else? They're pretty straightforward. Okay, let's move on. We already had some discussions on pattern matching in the previous section. Let's take a look at pattern matching again. So the general format of pattern matching is that we are matching some value, some value match, and we're matching it according to patterns. And those patterns, they can be the case classes, uh, they can even be arbitrary classes which implement the unapply method. Uh, they can be comparison with actual values, like here we're matching a, an x int with an actual value. And also they can have so-called guard conditions. So here an example is an example of a guard condition. So this is an x if x is less than or equal as zero. So the guard conditions are like additional if then else clauses in the middle of the pattern match. And sometimes it's quite useful. And then we can also have the fallback case, which is just an underscore, where if all else, if nothing else matches, then we have that. So here is an example. So, <clears throat> This is an example which uh, does um, matching by uh, the month's name. So it, it's kind of like parsing, uh, it is actually not parsing, it's formatting. You, you get a month's number, like where one is January and 12 is December and you are um, formatting it in some way. And of course, if it's not, uh, not the valid number, then you're returning a left. So I think we spoke uh, in the first lecture for, uh, about the data type called either, which either has a left value or a right value. And usually the um, left value is uh, gonna be the error channel and the right value is gonna be the success channel. So here is an example of pattern match uh, method called month's name. And my question to you, and we're actually going to be getting back to FizzBuzz in a moment. Uh, we're going to be getting back uh, to FizzBuzz in a moment. Um, but first, my question to you is how could we improve this? Um, pattern match this this month's name method. Does anyone have any ideas? The thing Vitaly about the input string ASDF is that it's from here and um I think you can just comment it out for now. It will be fine. And I'm not sure it's your compiler which is complaining about it. I think the text ex execution fails. So my compiler doesn't complain about that. Anyway, did anyone, did, did, did everyone understand the implementation of month's name method using pattern matching? If you did not understand how it works, then please write in chat and I will try to explain it a bit better. Uh, I think someone uh, stayed on previous task here, so they need some explanation maybe. Okay, which one was that? Maybe I missed it in the chat. Uh, okay, Kip. Vitaly is stuck. What is the question, Vitaly? He, he didn't get if his solution was correct. He did not get if his, his solution looks, looks, looks correct. Looks good. It looks good. 
also uh, said. The test that... succeed, Vitaly. Yuri S is right. If the test succeed, then it's correct. Also, there is uh, implementation from Kirill that looks correct. Kirill is asking if he needs the else. Yes, you do need the else because if it's not the fizz buzz, if it's not buzz, it's not fizz, then you have to return the n as a string, which you do. And whether it's nicer to do the uh, string interpolation or it's nicer to do to string, uh, I don't have a strong opinion. I, I think it's fine. Um, so what are the outstanding questions on FizzBuzz? Okay, now, now everything is clear. Okay, so let's move back to pattern matching. So this here is a month's name method. My first um, question is, do you understand how it actually works? Okay, Yuri says thinks it's pretty self-explanatory. Why do we need two channels? Well, because we want to be very clear if our formatting succeeded or failed. We want to force the client, whoever is calling month's name with an integer, we want to make it very clear to him if we succeeded or failed. We don't want to throw exceptions because we don't know what he will get, what the caller is going to do with those exceptions. Uh, we want kind of to make sure that the caller, in case there's an error, the caller uh, can't miss that there's an error. He can't just like, I don't know, let the exception bubble up and then at the end of the world where the application is executed, it crashes. That's, uh, that's not really what, what how we write code in Scala in general. It's only like basically for errors which are recoverable, um, we want to make the errors explicit only for, uh, for uh, th things which are unrecoverable, like out of memory. Um, so type error messages string, it is a type alias indeed uh, for better readability. Um, the thing is, Quite often, we may, instead of a string error message, we would use something better. Um, but um, in this case, because this is a, a, a test example, I'm just using it for error. Uh, like, I don't want us to focus on this part. This part, it can be discussed. We could have a custom ADT which describes our errors or, or something else more advanced. Uh, but the main thing is here, where we're saying either we get an error or we get a string which is a success. Uh, it's actually not that type safe in a sense that if you just do this without any, any extras, then you can say like error uh, is uh, error message. Uh, and then you can say, well, some string uh, and do this assignment and the compiler doesn't actually complain. Uh, and sometimes you want the compiler to complain because you want to distinguish, is this string the string that you will only use for error messages uh, or, or it's a generic string that we're fine to assign to any string and that's where tag types and, and maybe some other things come in. But, but we will get to that at some later stage. Um, so let's see, I missed some chat here. Let's see, what did I miss? So yes, so we need two channels because we want to make it very explicit. Did a recoverable error occurred or is it a success? And indeed, Yelena, we don't really like to throw exceptions as in Java because our experience is that these exceptions often don't get handled at the place where we expect them to be handled. Instead, people keep doing these uh, try something uh, 
catch uh, runtime. I'm actually not sure how it's written in Scala anymore. Runtime exception uh, in Java. Ye is throw new exception e and all that. You know, we keep doing this, and it's all just adds to the noise, and it's kind of uh, it doesn't really make our software more maintainable. It makes it worse. Um, Kirill, I don't understand how the exception is going to help him more than returning a, a, a left here. I mean, if we are then using this month, um, we, we would do like uh, result is month name 17. And here we can quite explicitly do result match, uh, but we, we can do also other things but like left error, do something, case right. Um, we are making the client be very explicit about what he does with the errors uh, instead of letting him forget that the error occurred and like misprocessing it. Uh, and of course, with checked exceptions in Java, you, um, you can't miss the exception, but it has some other, it has some other um, drawbacks because then you're forced to handle it all. So Yuris S is asking, wouldn't it be case error message? Uh, no, it wouldn't because the type of this is an either and either is an ADT uh, with two subtypes, left and right. He could mix left and right. Uh, in general, Scala developers don't mix left and right because they're very used that in either left is the error channel and right is the success channel. They're extremely used to that. And the other thing is um, you can do also other things. You can like do a, a map uh, over the success channel. So you can do So you can do this. Uh, so this map is going to only execute on the success channel because either is right biased. Uh, previously, either long some time ago, some years ago, either was not right bi biased, so you couldn't do this. But now, either is right biased, and this map is going to execute only on the success channel, and it will ignore the um, the error channel. Um, I think we will have more examples of this as we go forward on the course. So let's get back to the question of uh, what are the, how would you improve month's name? Igor, any ideas? How would we improve month's name? Yeah. Okay, Igor, I like your idea. So. <laughs> Uh, I was. Uh, you told that ADT improvement isn't uh, the one you. Are uh, here. I think ADT improvement uh, could could be helpful. We 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 could indeed do that. But I was thinking in this case, I didn't think about that. I was thinking about the implementation there. I like Igor uh, Reshetnikov's suggestion that we use uh, a. Uh, so yeah, I, I, thought, I thought about this as well. So we can do things like... And then here, uh, we can do things like... I'm, I'm, I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna... I'm not gonna retype all the months names. Uh, but uh, here we can then do um, 
this. And then here we can do uh, so here we can do this. Uh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, right, sorry. Um, yes, yeah, so another idea. Okay, Ulysses is asking, the type error message literally to distinguish left from right in the match. Uh, the type error message is really here. I mean, we could describe here this like this. It would be the same thing. It would be exactly the same thing and nothing would change. The reason I introduced the type alias uh, error message is because I thought it was more clear and descriptive in this uh, type definition. Uh, and because in a real software, instead of the string, we could be starting having some more fancy, you know, instead of error message, it would be like a case class error message. Um, error code customer context. I don't know. Whatever. Um, anyway. Uh, Yuris, did I answer your, okay, I answered your question, Yuris. Uh, so what other questions did we not answer? So I like the suggestions where we are passing in the uh, month's names uh, because um, we could have multiple locales. I mean, uh, or, or we maybe this whole idea is wrong and we should generally not be doing this we should instead be using the java time i'm actually not sure which of the java time formatters are providing these months names but if you read the java time documentation just a little bit uh, then surely you can uh, find a quick solution so that's another option uh, I would expect an enum. So Sergey is asking, will this solution work faster than the previous? I'm actually not sure. I think like you have to do benchmarks to check and good benchmarking is quite complicated. Uh, you, you can't just like run small micro benchmarks and then assume it's gonna work. Um, I don't have a good answer. Uh, I would expect an enum. Um, yeah, and actually. Okay, so objects. Yeah, so th actually the normal kind of uh, enum for months would probably be sealed trade month. Months, case object January extends months and so forth. Uh, because um, while Skull Three, I think Skull Three is, I think, improving how enums are done in Scala. The current default enums in Scala, they have their drawbacks. Um, okay, let's move back. Let's move back. This month's name was really just a way how to explain uh, the pattern matching, and now. I hope you can use the newly learned pattern matching in order to re-implement FizzBuzz if you didn't do so already using pattern matching. And actually that's here, that's FizzBuzz too.
Okay. So we have two solutions. I suppose others are still needing a bit more time. Someone already previously put this solution into the chat. Yeah, that was um, that was Uris S. So we still have two solutions, unless Uris S wants to lend one of his yeah. solutions. Um, also, Sergey should be as well. Ah, oh, yes, you're right. There's three solutions. Yeah, so we can actually see there's like two types of solutions. The one is which is one is one which is very uh, similar to um, to the um, if uh, else statement, and maybe is more lengthy. And then we have Dmitri's solution, which is quite interesting. You have an uppercase letter in this bus. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> just, uh, a, just a typo. Yeah, still. Okay, now it works. So, and of course, the main uh, feature of pattern matching is that you have to align the er arrows correctly. And the other main feature is that you can also use, hold on, how do we do this? Does anyone know the keyboard shortcut? Um, I'm actually not sure how, how to get the fancy error. Can you copy paste it in the chat? Hey, you mean uh, alignment? No, I mean the single character. That single character. Um, Hold on. Um, I'll find it. So does this work, do you think?
It should. It, it, it does work. Did it actually complain about it at some point? Anyway, so you can also use these arrows. I'm not saying you should, but you can. Um, okay, any comments on pattern matching so far? Yes, yeah, Sergey, I don't know what's faster. I think two string is probably faster, but I think two string is faster, but you never know. Maybe the compiler is really smart and like exactly this special case, it optimizes to two string anyway. So maybe it's the same thing. Um, okay. So we still have 20 minutes. How much time do we have left here? Quite a bit. Okay. So let's move on to recursion. Unless there's more questions on pattern matching. So in functional programming, you use recursion sometimes. And sometimes you don't. And sometimes you don't have to. So it's a little bit matter of taste. Uh, but a recursion uh, is when a function calls itself. So, for example, if you have a... Yes, Sergey, why is it no, no, no? Okay, fine. Uh, so, if you have a list of integers, uh, and you want to get the sum, of the list of integers. So one thing what you can of course uh, do, like you have this list of integers. Uh, in Scala, you can of course say L sum and you will get the sum. But if you don't wanna use that just as an uh, exercise, then you can implement it recursively. You can say if the list is empty, then the sum is zero. And if not, then we take the head of the list and we invoke someone, the same function on the tail of the list, on the remind, remainder of the list, on the list without the first element. The first element is the head and the other elements of a Scala list are the tail. So my question to you is, what are the risks of this? Like, why shouldn't we be doing this? I mean, besides the fact that, uh, so everyone is saying that we should look it up on Stack Overflow. That's a good answer. We should look almost everything up on Stack Overflow. Yes, it's Stack Overflow error. Um, so yeah, we got, uh, we, we can, um, we can have such a long list that there's not enough space on the stack to, um, uh, to have all these recursive invocations and we'll get a stack overflow error. Um, so to the rescue, partial rescue comes an annotation in Scala, which is called tail rec. So some functions can be optimized with, with tail call optimization where stack isn't used. It's when the, um, when the recursive invocation happens late in the function call, therefore you don't have to use the stack necessarily. Uh, and tail rec is gonna verify that this particular function like lost uh, can be tail call uh, optimized and thus it can be stack safe. Uh, now in reality, um, recursion isn't actually used that often. Uh, I mean, sometimes it's used, sometimes not. It's a little bit of programmer preference, but they're useful um, larger building blocks, which um, 
are um, a replacement in a way for recursion. So for example, there's fold left, which takes a zero element, which we will use zero for our sum. And um, it then invokes using a accumulator and the next element of the list going through all the list elements. And basically this is another implementation of sum using fold left. This is yet another using fold right, which does the same thing, but I guess the other way around. Uh, and then there's sum four, uh, which uh, uses reduce. And reduce is gonna throw an exception in case the list is empty. Therefore, we're checking that manually. And then reduce is gonna um, invoke, I think it's some arbitrary uh, order uh, on all elements. And then, you know, it will take the result from some of the reduce and again, add another element. Um, so these are all different implementations of the sum uh, method. So my question to you is, how do you think list sum is implemented in the standard library? And while you're writing, let's take a look. Yeah, I mean native list sum. Okay, actually, I think the answer is that it's using uh, num zero and reduce, where it's taking the numeric type class parameter. Um, some of these standard library methods, and I actually didn't locate the, the, the list one upon a quick review, they're actually implemented very uh, imperatively. So they're using a lot of like just standard loops going through because that's faster but they're of course hiding it under a more functional programming friendly facade. So they, uh, they, um, the answer is that, uh, you know, sometimes for purpose of performance, you are writing immutable, uh, sorry, imperative code uh, and the trade-off is worth it. Uh, Igor, do you want to add anything to this? No, I think we can see in standard library even with some method like how reduce left is working. So, if, 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 if fold left was working, right? Yeah. Oh, yeah, so here is the fold left. So, uh, so this is an example. As you can see, I was saying avoid mutable uh, variables. 
but in reality, we have them here, uh, and we have a like a while loop uh, because that's faster because that's invoked a, a lot of times. So it's not a not a dogma. Okay. So we have um, we have ten minutes left. Um, let's finish with this. Uh, let's finish with this exercise. Apply n times for ints. Uh, so replace with the correct implementation so that apply n times for ints works correctly. Uh, so you're being uh, provided n, and you are applying the function f n times to the x. So it's kind of like if you're being passed n of 4 and the function is plus 1 and the parameter x is 3, then it's 3 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 plus 1 or 7. Is the exercise reasonably clear? Is anyone unclear on what you need to do here? Then please write in chat and I will try to answer in a different way. Also, I posted here a link to the survey. I hope it works. Uh, so if you could fill it out, it would be really great. I mean, we're, we're going to be wrapping up after this exercise and questions and answers. But, uh, but um, that's the survey.
Very good, Yuris. In case any of you have uh, finished the task, or if you have questions about the task, I mean, if you've finished the task, then think of questions about the rest of the topics we covered today or other scholar related topics. And if you have questions about the task, then, then ask. Kirill, do the tests pass for you? Yes, you so I think that's the beauty of it, isn't it? That this solution also works for apply end times. And one could even argue that the apply end times is actually clearer then apply n times for ints. Uh, Yuris, why do you think why do you think apply n times is clearer than apply n times for ints if the implementation is pretty much the same? Yeah, I mean, we, we jumped with Uris, we jumped ahead a little bit, we jumped to the next exercise as well to apply n times, where the implementation of apply n times is actually the same as apply n times for ints. Just the type signatures which change, uh, where it works for any type of A, where we have the F. Uh, and, uh, and indeed, Uris is very right because this int, the fact that we have a specific, like apply n times, it works for any a, not just ints. Uh, it's more clear what it does. Uh, you can call it in the wrong way. Uh, like it's more difficult to call it the wrong way. And it's also more difficult to uh, introduce bugs into it. Like here at one point, as I started, I, I actually, if, if you saw how I typed, instead of n less than equals as zero, I typed x. So if we would have this bug here in apply n times for ints, we can introduce it and not notice. In apply n times, if we would make the same bug, we just swap the x and the n in the first if because we were tired or something. Suddenly the compiler is quite angry at us and is saying, you know what? I think you're doing something wrong and forces us to fix our code. While here, when we weren't using generics, uh, it doesn't, it, it, it allows us to mix up this N with the X. Um, so in, in this case, I think it's clear that this method uh, 
is better than this one. And it is as powerful because basically, um, I mean, you, you can express, uh, you can express one with the other, but not the other way around. Does it make sense so far? Does anyone need help with implementing this? Yuris, I think we need to explain that uh, uh, some everyone needs to take a look at uh, function definition that it from int to int, and uh, that's why there is in body as well x int uh, arrow and actual body, so everyone gets it. Um. Are you saying, uh, Igor, that uh, that we are returning a function here? Yeah. Yes. Exactly. Not everybody is uh, able to see it uh, clear clear enough. Yes. So, yeah, so uh, it, it's a good point. Uh, so here we are returning a function from end to end. That's the return type which I'm selecting here. Yeah, Yuris, you're saying the equal sign after the return type makes it harder, but that's just Scala. That's how we write it. That's after a while you get used to it and it's fine. I mean, we don't really do this ever. Uh, I'm not saying we would often be defining functions like this. It's a, a little bit partially a cumbersome example on purpose. Uh, it's, it's, it's an exercise to get you more used to recursion and more used to higher order functions. Maybe normally we wouldn't do it like this. Uh, but I guess what you're proposing is this. I mean, Vitaly, your uh, suggestion is also interesting. Was, I mean, Yuris, I see where you're coming from. But uh, that's not usually what we do. I mean, the usual Scala uh, conventions, I think, are more aligned to this. But of course, in your project, you can introduce some other uh, convention. And uh, Vitaly is suggesting something like um, something like this. Yes. And So I guess Vitaly, you're suggesting something like something like this. No, the equal sign can't be skipped, Yuris. I mean, the, it can be skipped in a one rare case. Uh, you can basically do, uh, at least you used to be able to do something like this. Uh, and this would be equivalent to uh, this, but this is a depreciated syntax and I think it's going to disappear in Scala 3. Um, I see you is where you're coming from. And I think initially I felt the same way about the equal sign, but after a while you get used to it and you kind of, uh, it's fine after a while. Okay, Vitaly, if you think this method signature is clear, um, that's fine. And we can also do something here. We can say like,
Okay. And here we learn to do generic type aliases, which is also nice. So if, if uh, I actually agree, this is more clear. So thanks for suggesting this. Uh, and I hope also the method implementations became uh, more clear. Okay, uh, I think we're wrapping up this uh, particular workshop. Uh, I will again post the link to the um, survey. Please fill it out. That way we actually know if we should uh, organize further um, meetups along these same lines or, uh, or not. Uh, if we do, then for the next one, we will proceed with control structures and then with data structures. And there's a lot of material there. Actually, there's a lot of uh, nice exercises, if I remember right. Um, and um, if you have any more questions on this particular, uh, the subject of this uh, workshop, then please ask them in chat. If not, then uh, thank you very much for attending. Thank you very much for the good questions and for the suggestions how to uh, how to improve the code. All right, thank you very much. Have a have a great uh, have a great um, three days if you're in Riga, Latvia. <laughs> thank you all. Thank you.